Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we'll we'll jump right into uh, in, in, into to our panel for the day. Um, we've heard a lot about the importance of, of, of transportation infrastructure to the success of our of our food supply sectors, um, and 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 really again, kind of we'll stress that if we, if we can't move it, we can't sell it. And 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 to kind of dive into that a little bit, our, our next panel will discuss how Canada can increase the capacity and efficiency of of its critical trade infrastructure uh, with a particular focus on our our ports. Uh, which are, are are very much critical to bringing our ag uh, products uh, to to the global market. So, uh, with me today, I'd like to welcome our panelists: uh, Guillaume Brassard, our Vice President, of Development, Marketing, and International Relations at the Port of Montreal; David Miller, who's a Senior Advisor to the Executive Vancouver Fraser Port Authority; Michael Inman, Director, of Business Development, Prince Rupert Port Authority; and Paul McIsaac, Senior Vice President, Halifax Port Authority. So, welcome everybody, and thanks uh, thanks uh, again for 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 joining us. Maybe to kind of kick things off, uh, jumping into our first question is, is, is how, how are your ports connecting uh, Canadian ag to the world? And, and, and to kind of get us started, maybe Guillaume, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll call on you to, uh, to get us started. Yes, hi everyone. Thank you, uh, Robin, uh, for the introduction and for having us on, on the panel. Uh, it's a very uh, hot topic as, as we speak. Uh, so to give you a, a little bit of a per perspective on the Port of Montreal, uh, you know, we're the second largest port uh, in Canada. We uh, we are a very diversified port. So we handle uh, containers, yes, about 1.7, 1.8 million on a yearly basis. Uh, we are uh, also having uh, liquid bulk uh, and also uh, grain a lot in, in, in the Port of Montreal and cruises uh, also uh, and our cruise, cruise terminal in the, in the old Port of Montreal. Uh, so how do we connect the world? Uh, it's uh, We have eight services regularly on the container side. Uh, we uh, we have uh, direct services to the Med uh, and to the uh, the Northern Europe uh, 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 I would say markets. Uh, but what we saw in the past uh, couple of years, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, of trades that have been grown uh, to and from Asia, and mainly uh, in the agri and the food business uh, in containerized goods. So, uh, like 25% of our I would say market right now is uh, going uh, to or from Asia. Uh, so how do we do this uh, from Montreal? Uh, there's uh, there's a transshipment, uh, I would say hubs in the Med and also in North Europe where the ships are coming uh, to uh, from Asia and are connecting to direct services uh, to the port of Montreal. Uh, so we're connected to 140 uh, countries uh, worldwide. We have uh, six major uh, container uh, shipping companies, uh, major lines that are connecting uh, the Port of Montreal. Uh, but also uh, we deliver uh, grain by uh, bulk grain uh, with the retro terminal that we have uh, in Montreal. Uh, since uh, you know, Montreal was known as uh, the largest uh, grain uh, port uh, in the past, a few decades ago. Uh, now we have one uh, container, uh, not container, sorry, grain uh, bulk terminal that is actually in operation. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, that's about it about uh, about us in Montreal. And uh, I'll be happy to uh, discuss and share our thoughts on the different topics today. Thanks, thanks, Guillaume. And and, and David, maybe maybe kind of bringing bringing it over to the West Coast. Um, you know how 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 is how is the Port of Vancouver? Um, you know connecting connecting our our, our Canadian agriculture uh, to the world. Sure thing. You know grain uh, grain in particular, but ag products in general of the uh, are a big. Uh, big part of, uh, of what we move. Uh, we've got nine terminals that handle uh, exclusively or primarily grain, and we've got quite a bit of capacity. Um, I, we're, we're well positioned for the, uh, the growth in, uh, in Western Canadian uh, grain exports, which, uh, which we've seen uh, with the occasional blip for, uh, for some serious drought years, but otherwise we've seen pretty steady growth in grain uh, over the last, uh, 10 years or so. And uh, actually I was in Saskatchewan meeting the government yesterday and they, they are quite convinced that that trend will, will continue. So we're, uh, we have a good deal of capacity for, uh, for grain. So I don't think there's any, any concerns there in terms of able, being able to handle what comes at us. Uh, not directly agriculture, but of course we also have significant capacity for, for potash, which is important with the new uh, large, uh, Large mine coming on on stream there in the next in the next few years, um, and we've certainly seen a trend of of more uh, grain and specialty crops moving in containers uh, that may have previously moved in bulk. 
and uh, we uh, we're uh, at the moment we're in, in good shape in terms of container capacity. And of course, we finally have uh, got our terminal two uh, container project through the uh, federal environmental process after about uh, nine 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 and a half years. And we've also now got provincial uh, approval of that project. Um, there's a few more permit, a few more permits to be uh, to be completed, but uh, but we'll, we should have that uh, terminal in place uh, um, before we uh, we hit uh, too uh, serious a shortage of capacity for for container movements either. And 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 and, and Michael, maybe maybe moving up uh, to, to to for Prince Rupert, um, I, I think uh, you know there's there's a, there's a good story, and 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 again another another positive uh, that I that I saw maybe maybe at the end of last week uh, with 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 some good news over over at Rupert. But uh, you know how 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 is Rupert connecting Canadian Ag to the world? Well, I think via the CN Rail network, um, I think we have about we're moving about five to five and a half million tons of wheat canola and barley through our Group Bulk Grain uh, facility, Prince Rupert Grain, owned by Viterra, Cargill, and Richardson. Uh, and echoing some of Vancouver's comments, I mean, we are seeing an increasing amount of not just specialty crops, but other agri products like grains uh, being loaded either at the port with Raymont Logistics and moving through our terminal operator, DP World. Uh, but also source loaded containerized and they're going all over the world um i mean the middle east asia southeast asia are, are big markets but so are south america uh to countries both with tidewater access but i think a growing story is kind of more of this containerization where we have the shipment of containers to landlock countries that are kind of unlocking small and medium customers seeking smaller purchase volumes or kind of different service levels uh, so I would probably say there's probably a, probably closer to 7 million tons of, of agri product moving through the port currently in containers and by bulk. And, 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 and Paul, maybe, maybe bringing you into the conversation. How about, how about from, from, a, from a Halifax perspective? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. Yeah, the port of Halifax is uh, mainly our, our cargo business is mainly containerized. We have a little bit of bulk in project, but it's mainly containerized and, and our exports are, are through containers predominantly refrigerated cargo, berries, vegetables, potatoes, pulse products, uh, those, those sorts of things, uh, cereals as well, and additionally seafood. Seafood is, is perhaps the highest dollar value export through the Port of Halifax when it comes to ag product. Um, yeah, that'd be about it. So we, we, we talked a lot of, of, about resiliency. I think I think the word resiliency, um, reliability is, is are, 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 are words that, uh, that 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 seem to kind of cross my my desk uh, and come out of my mouth uh, way, way way more often these days than than than, than, uh, than maybe in the past. But uh, maybe maybe kind of Paul, continuing with you, um, is, is 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 what are some of the key priorities that uh, that that you guys are, are working on as a as, as a port authority to, uh, to 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 help on that uh, resiliency piece. Well, I think one of the key priorities in everything that we're doing is is we're looking at at things with a sustainability lens. You know, decarbonization initiatives throughout the supply chain and 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 what role we can play within it. Um, additionally, uh, Nova Scotia and the Port of Halifax in particular are, is is connected to the rest of the country through a through a very narrow strip of land called the Isthmus of Chignecto, which unfortunately is now subject to substantial climate risk from climate change. And so not only does that connect us to the rest of Canada, it connects Canada to the rest of the world in the other direction from an export perspective. So that's something we're, we're fa fairly focused on as a port. Uh, the two provinces of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick as well as the federal government are also focused on that. So that's something that will have to be, uh, have to be looked at in the future. Additionally, uh, you talk about resiliency. A resilience in modern transportation infrastructure across Canada is required and necessary to uh, allow for the efficient movement of goods within the country, because you know many of the goods are produced in the hinterland and they have to get to tidewater to get to export markets. So without that uh, resilient and efficient infrastructure, it, uh, it won't be easy. And, 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 and Michael, maybe, maybe, maybe turning to you, um, you know, what, um, what, are, what, are, what are some of the key priorities that you see uh, that, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, the Port and Prince Rupert is, 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 is taking a look at to, to make sure that we can handle um, you know, perhaps the, 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 the growing uh, agri-food exports uh, that, that, that we're seeing? 
Yeah, thanks. I think, uh, I mean, backing up a bit, I think geopolitical tensions, whether it's past uh, tariff issues with Canada, China, or where we saw some impacts to bulk canola shipments, for example, or the current uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, I think we're also seeing a situation where food security is also driving a lot of changes and where these flows are going, whether in uh, Canada, it's got moving coastally in some cases, or, or and globally, we're seeing a lot of the, those food security, seeing millions of tons of cargo, uh, agri-cargo kind of move differently than maybe it did typically three plus years ago. I think when we get into weather and climate change impacts, I think notable things like uh, resiliency for Canada's network in terms of infrastructure optionality, in terms of looking at different routings, whether that's Thunder Bay or Prince Rupert, uh, using different rail lines and different different outlets um, to take into account the risk of some of these climate change or weather disruption events. And then, as you mentioned earlier, Robin, the Prince Rupert Port Authority made a big announcement where we're working with Raymont Logistics um, and ourselves to enable a large scale 400,000 TEU per annum tidewater transloading facility that'll be operational starting in 26 and fully operational, call it in early 27. And I think that's a big story in terms of driving optionality for Canadian shippers um, on the West Coast, but also nationally. Uh, and a big story in Rupert is kind of the scale and scope of the rail infrastructure that we're able to bring, bring online. And then we have an excess terminal capacity, both in terms of uh, volumes being down over the last 18 months, but also subsequent terminal expansions that DP World has brought on for our container terminal. So I think that's a that's a, a big priority for us right now. And then we continue to kind of push the additional capacity at Prince Rupert Grain where there is additional bulk. But uh, yeah, I think food security is a big discussion, not only in terms of infrastructure and resilience, uh, but also in terms of inland productivity. Thank you. And, and 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 David, maybe maybe turning this kind of over 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 to uh, to to a Vancouver lens as well is is I know you know you mentioned um, you know your 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 port uh, ex expanding um, you know only nine and a half years um, I think I I, I had hair uh, nine and a half years ago uh, at, at, at that point but how 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 is this going to help uh, handle um, you know the, this our, our growing need to, to to export Canadian goods. Well, I mean, it, it uh, enables us to stay ahead of the curve. I mean, certainly uh, our projections lead us to believe that uh, that by the time uh, the new terminal comes uh, on stream, we will be uh, testing the uh, the capacity limits of the of the existing terminals. So, from that perspective, it will be quite quite important. But frankly, the most important thing we're working on right now in terms of uh, of maintaining. Uh, the uh, the flow of of goods and and uh, maintaining uh, proper control of of uh, of our system is we've uh, just implemented the first phase of an active vessel vessel traffic management system, and this will have numerous impacts. I mean, um, when the um, when the uh, Trans Mountain pipeline is fully on stream, that will mean an extra. Uh, probably 300 uh, vessel movements a year into the port, which is a pretty dramatic increase. And all of those uh, those ships will have to pass under the Second Narrows Bridge, which of course is the uh, the rail bridge that links uh, uh, the, north, the terminals on the North Shore uh, to the rail system. So uh, that is a lift bridge. And uh, the more time that, uh, that bridge is, uh, is is up for ship movements the fewer trains that can cross it so so uh the sort of efficiency that we that we think this system will bring is going to be pretty important um it'll be really the first venture into kind of an air traffic control type system for ship movements um up till now ships have have largely uh moved uh the the pilots have had some role in in deciding what moves when which is not a job they particularly want and uh, a lot of it has been ad hoc. And so uh, um, a more tightly managed system will enable us to move more, uh, more ships safely uh, through the port. And uh, it will also enable us, uh, give us more accurate and up to the minute readings in terms of things such as tide patterns so that we can take, a, take advantage of, uh, of uh, what's there and not, uh, not be dealing with uh, information that's a year old. 
And 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 going back, uh, Guillaume, um, you know, some some key priorities that you're working on, and 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 uh, and, and how how the Port of Montreal is is is, is preparing for this. Uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, good comments, and uh, I'm going to piggyback on my uh, my colleagues uh, where, with the containerizing the containerization of grain. That's something that we see a lot. Uh, also in our premises in Montreal, there is yes, the Montreal stick is a big player on the west on the west coast, on the east coast, uh, also in Montreal. Uh, there's also Canis that is uh, investing a lot into their infrastructure that they have in the port of Montreal. So they have grain uh, silos that they are managing and they are uh, containerizing the grain on our premises uh, in Montreal. Uh, and they were just announced uh, a few months ago that they will invest up to 18 million. Uh, to enhance that capacity and to support uh, the demand uh, on the exportation of grain uh, in Canada. Um, so that's one thing uh, that, that we are working with uh, with them, but also um, we're referring at the uh, RB2 expansion. Uh, and uh, and at, in Montreal, we are actually almost uh, at capacity. We have a container, a container capacity uh, ending of 2.1 million TUs. Uh, so we are at 1.7, 1.8, uh, depending on the year. And, um, and so reaching the 85% of your capacity, I mean, you're, you're starting to clog. So that's the reason why we're expanding uh, on the South Shore of Montreal uh, with our big color car expansion uh, that actually just, uh, we just announced uh, the support of the federal, the federal government uh, on this expansion. And we'll, we'll be ready to build, uh, start building next year uh, for a commissioning date in 2028. So, so I think uh, one of the messages is, yes, we need to, to be more risen by uh, yes building into capacity but wanting also is uh, uh what we see more more and more is a lot of different diversification also and optionalities that uh, the customers and the, the traders or the carriers are looking for uh, so having options is something that uh, makes uh, your supply chain more resilient uh, overall uh, and uh, i'm from the i'm from the energy sector and one one thing that uh, we were doing in the energy sector and we're still doing uh, is invest and and support uh, trade corridors. And so uh, in, in the energy sector, that's the way it was working. I think we have to invest and to make our trade corridors uh, um, more resilient. Uh, and this is just not only about the port, uh, but it's also about the rail, about the connectivity for trucking. So uh, this is things that we need to look over a bit more and uh, plan ahead uh, a bit more uh than i think what uh, we're doing right now so uh, that's i would say one of the main focus that we that we do in montreal you know we we have the st lawrence river there's a big ecosystem ecosystem that we have to manage and to deal with uh so having the mind or the way to think as a uh, as a working group like or manage the whole ecosystem more as a business unit i think will benefit all from that kind of uh, of approach or or spirit in doing our businesses uh, into our ecosystems, and and and, and Guillaume, thanks. Uh, like you, 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 you kind of are are are, are getting into to, to where I want to go, kind of in this conversation next. I know I know we're talking about kind of the optimistic pieces, um, but but where would the fun be if, if if we only focused on 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 the optimistic pieces? And 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 Michael, maybe maybe I'll call on you, and 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 uh, maybe I, I won't I won't call it the challenges, but but what are what are some of the pieces that uh, that, that that are are keeping you up at night uh, on 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 this piece? Yeah, I think when we back up and go to a higher level as a collection of ports we talked about and talk about Canada as a trading nation, I think trade and supply chain infrastructure projects are typically very large, they're complicated, they're capital intensive initiatives, and they usually require significant private sector investment. Uh, that is typically trying to take advantage of an opportunity window for a commodity group or or new kind of global or, or different environment for overseas partners. And their development kind of unlocks economic benefits. It improves our competitiveness. But the object fundamentally of moving these projects forward is about unlocking private sector investment. And that's typically hindered in Canada by two general themes. One, the amount of time required to review and permit a project. And two, looking for projects themselves that solve broader issues or can enact federal policy, which can all, can not only delay and create uncertainty with regulatory processes, but can also lead to the, to the deterioration of a project's business case. And these are challenges that we've experienced in Prince Rupert over the last little while, and I think are a larger issue for the nation. Um, I think in some cases, these delays have kind of led to projects 
not moving forward or projects coming online later than desired, if you will. And I think there's an opportunity to have an effective strategy to enable public policy and infrastructure dollars to be coordinated and move forward prioritized investments in a timely manner. And, and, and Paul, maybe, 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 maybe kind of posing, posing that same question to you from, uh, from, from uh, a, a Halifax perspective, you know, what are you, what are you seeing as the, as the challenges, uh, you know, in, in, in order to, for, for, for us to be able to handle this, uh, this, this increased, uh, increased capacity and, and, and just the ability to, again, uh, make sure that we can, we can get our, our, our Canadian goods to market. Well, I would echo a lot of the comments that uh, that Michael just had. You know, the regulatory approval process is difficult. Also, the regulations that we as port authorities uh, operate under are, are fairly prescriptive, and they don't allow us a lot of uh, immediate flexibility. I mean, over time, we we have the ability to go and and look for approvals or look for increases in mooring limits and, the, and that sort of thing. But in in the short term, it's it's hard to be a true partner on some of these development projects. When you don't have the readily available financial capacity, so that that leads us to a situation where sometimes the, the agreements we do are, are maybe not the agreements we'd like to do, but the agreements we're kind of, we we're sort of forced to do given given those constraints. So I think I think those are those are perhaps issues, and 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 these are are, are to be addressed. The federal government is is undergoing uh, reviews of the Port Authority regulations and 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 the Canada Marine Act, and see if there's modernization that can come from that. So we're we're hopeful that when that comes through, it'll be it'll be helpful, and, and we'll put us on a more commercial footing. But uh, but presently, we're we're a little bit on the back foot uh, at present. And, and and Guillaume, kind of continuing continuing westward in, in in Montreal, what are what are what do what do you see as as, as the challenges here? Uh, a few ones, and I I'll I'll uh, I agree with my colleagues on infra projects. Or this is very difficult to to plan to get financed. Uh, that's a big, uh, it's a big, uh, I would say, a big challenge that we have uh, in ports. Uh, in addition to this, uh, the, fi the financial capacity and uh, borrowing capacity. So there's a few items uh, that are uh, limiting uh, ports uh, to invest and to develop uh, infrastructure. You know, our role is to, is we're landlords, so we are supporting the ecosystem, our operators, uh, the stakeholders in the industry to develop and to have access to, I would say, fluid uh, and, uh, and top of notch infrastructure. So, so our role is to invest. Uh, so it's sometimes, uh, it's, it's uh, I would say, it's getting more and more complicated to do. So uh, that I'm gonna, uh, that's, that's uh, a little bit what my colleagues resume. One thing that uh, was not mentioned is, um, and that's a big challenge, uh, I think in the ecosystem that, or in the transportation industry overall is the data sharing and, uh, and having the opportunity to follow goods and to to uh, share the data to be able to have uh, applications and uh, and uh, visibility on the data that's something uh, that needs to be enhanced uh, and you know ports we, we yes we do um, trade goods and containers and but we also have a lot of data that we uh, are relying on or that we can manage uh, and so ports may be able to play a role uh, I would say a neutral role in managing that data to the benefit of the supply chain. Uh, so that's something that uh, that I think we need to think of, and um, and I'm I'm uh, I'm anxious to see uh, what will be coming over uh, with the uh, uh, with the supply chain task force. And I think that was part of one of the uh, was the conclusion of the report that was done uh, and completed last year. Um, so yeah, they, these are. The three items that I, I would say are are big challenges for ports right now. And, and kind of continuing on that on that piece of uh, you know we're 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 just over I guess 365 days since uh, since since the release of um, the supply chain task force report where 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 a lot of these things seem to be mentioned as uh, as, as as opportunities for for. Um, to, to, to ensure that our, our, our supply chains are, are, are working at, uh, at, at, at as the best that they can. Um, David, kind of coming to you, um, you know, we, we finally have, have seen kind of some movement. We have a new supply chain office that, uh, that, that we're, 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 we're setting up. So, so David, just wondering, wondering your thoughts, um, you know, hopes for, for, for the new supply chain office um, and, and, and how, uh, how it can kind of interact with, with, with not only, I guess, other, other government pieces like the National Trade Corridors Fund, 
Um, but uh, maybe 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 you could share kind of your thoughts and and, and hopes for, uh, for 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 this piece. Sure. Well, I think I mean the 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 data piece is is very important, and and uh, you know the we have we have been uh, had a had a data project and un underway for some time now, but it's it's been it's been a challenge. I mean the various players are are quite happy to uh, release certain types of data that uh, that you know the ones that make them look good. They're less uh, they're less. Uh, uh, willing to to release some of the other data, there uh, everything tends to be done with a, an eye on the Canadian Transportation Agency and potential for cases, and so people are are very selective and cautious with their data. And the new powers that the federal government has uh, has given itself to uh, to enable them to uh, to to uh, secure data, I think, is going to be an important part of all this. But in terms of uh, of the the new office, I mean. Something that we think has has been really lacking in recent years, among the, with some of the earliest uh, Asia Pacific Gateway projects, we were able to make some quite dramatic improvements in terms of the supply chain, in terms of addressing bottlenecks and addressing some safety issues with some quite complex projects that involved large numbers of municipalities and uh, you know railroads and 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 uh, tenants at the port and. Uh, part of the reason that that was able to be done is that Transport Canada played quite an active role in terms of managing some of these projects. They were off of Portland. Uh, they were complicated. They involved, as I said, many municipal governments. We we uh, deal with 16 different municipalities and many First Nations. So th having Transport play that role, I'm not sure some of these projects that are great success stories today could have could have been done uh, without that. And now we're in a position where really there's nobody to play that role, so we have to play that role. But we don't really have the authority to play the role. Uh, we don't have the capacity to play the role particularly. So we, we've been managing some of these projects, but it, it's, uh, it's uh, quite challenging uh, something for us to do without, uh, without the government uh, somehow getting involved in helping to try uh, and move these more complex projects far, for, forward. And, and and Paul, maybe 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 your thoughts on 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 this one, in, in terms of kind of your hopes uh, for 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 the new uh, the new supply chain office. Sure. Well, we're we're clearly excited by it. Uh, we think it's very important. Uh, as an example, people would have seen what they call "quote unquote" congested ports for the past uh, few years, but but really that's just the symptom. It's not the cause. The, the cause is generally somewhere else in the supply chain, but because there's an available space for storage, it gets it gets seen at the port. So a few of my colleagues have talked about the importance of data, and, and that cannot be overstated. Really, it's it's through this coordinated compilation and sharing of the relevant data that, that will lead to fluidity and by extension efficiencies and cost savings within the supply chain. And, and that's what we're all striving for. I mean, it's not just about building, building more berths or building more warehouses or, or whatever. It's about making sure the goods move when they should and when they're expected to move and that the other resources are lined up appropriately whether it be labor or rail or truckers or, or, or whoever. So it's, it's, it's very, very important. And, and, and Guillaume kind of continuing, continuing from a Montreal perspective, I know, I know you kind of uh, brought up uh, the supply chain office. I'm not sure, sure. What, what, uh, what, what, what are your hopes uh, for, for, for this office? And, and I'm going to pick it back on what Paul just said, actually does, that is very, very important is the efficiency in the supply chain and, and to connect to the, there's not necessarily more rare warehouses or uh, uh, but the efficiency will lead in two things so being more competitive but also reducing the ghg emissions uh, of ships waiting at bird or before going to board so there's there's a lot of good things uh, on on improving the overall efficiency of the uh, of the supply chain so that's one thing that that i'm looking forward to see on how the office will uh, will assess that uh, one th other thing that uh, we in Montreal are focusing on and, and are promoting a lot is, you know, that we are limited in the way we could work uh, with uh, colleagues and other ports uh, overall. Uh, so there's operational things that we can do, but I think they will be, uh, it will be beneficial if we can extend the cooperation and the collaboration that we could have to enhance and to build on our, uh, I would say, not, not on the capacity, but, but the strength that we all have. Uh, so we are very different ports uh, and being able to work in a better way together uh, as, a, as a corridor, uh, as I was saying before, 
will be uh, will will be uh, will gain a lot from from this and an overall and in, in the country perspective. I think that's something that uh, uh, I expect the office to uh, take a look at a bit more closely and. I would say uh, ease a little bit the uh, the rules and the uh, the regulation uh, that prohibits sports and working and collaborate uh, uh, together. So uh, that these are the two things I would say I would I would add to what was uh, said before. And 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 Michael from from uh, from from your side hopes hopes for the new supply chain office. Well, I think I'll echo and build upon some of the comments by uh, my fellow panelists. I think uh, Prince Rupert Port Authority hopes the new supply chain office kind of provides a dedicated resource and playing a strategic role in moving trade and transportation projects forward on a timely basis and ensuring that government best investment, if it's required, is focused on enabling and unlocking private sector investment in a timely manner. Uh, in addition, I mean, we've talked about data. I think there's a, a role, as, as other panelists have suggested, around that's uh, uh, creating a central hub for aggregation of supply chain data. I think port authorities individually, and in some cases uh, in collaboration with other parties are looking at it from a gateway or just outside the gateway kind of anticipation. And I think there's an opportunity here to kind of optimize existing supply chains and inform future priorities. And I think the supply chain office could be that central coordinator. I think there's challenges in developing this. I think that we can all acknowledge and uh, successes and failures that we've seen to date in industry and with other with port authorities trying trying to move the needle forward on these kind of things. Um, but I think the opportunity to kind of connect everything from pro product the product from origin to destination and then acknowledging that competitive dynamic within that. I think if we can get a solution, I, it would provide a systemic lift for the for everyone for the entire country. And and and. I, I think what I'm what I'm hearing, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm kind of glad because I'm gonna I'm gonna try and tie this into to an economic growth question. And 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 Michael, maybe maybe I'll just stay with you. But we're 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 seeing that that minimal economic growth right now. Um, you know, you guys play a a, a massive uh, a massive part of, of of being able to to open the potential for economic growth. So maybe maybe I'll I'll, I'll kind of ask the question: How can how can we ensure that our supply chains remain competitive at this point i know i know we're talking about efficiencies and pieces like that but i'm wondering wondering if you could kind of add to to, to kind of that to just so so that we can we can hear how we can remain competitive and and how can we better kind of support canadian businesses uh to 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 again tap into that economic growth i think you bring up two really good uh, aspects to this and com being competitive and driving economic growth are definitely hand in glove if you will and i think it is the largest opportunity that ports can have a have a role in is connecting to overseas markets and moving beyond in some cases and and depending on the industry or or the percentage breakdown of uh, really focusing on overseas trade and and not just maybe the domestic or north american markets so i think there's there's an opportunity to kind of look at both capacity, efficiency, but also capability at multiple gateways or ports um, to kind of make sure that we can validate and, and provide information on being a really good partner. I think it ties into some of the other questions here uh, around data accuracy and availability. I think when we start talking about monitoring and measuring supply chain performance in a, uh, a more holistic way across multiple cargoes or or modes or, or that kind of thing. I think it kind of supports engagement with other countries and overseas customers to improve our collective reputation as a trading nation. Um, and as you'll get with a theme with some of my answers for these questions, I mean, a lot of where I go with this question is back to improving Canada's processes on major infrastructure projects. Um, this is a global play for our competitors and attracting investment. If you look at the Australia or US they're also proactively seeking ways to make regulatory processes more efficient, increase their own competitiveness for projects. And very uh, key is that global capital by having clear and coordinated review approaches. I think there's value in learning from other jurisdictions, but I think uh, absolutely we have to develop a Canadian approach or improve that Canadian approach. Um, and we need to recognize that there's a competition taking place and we need to understand the benchmarks that we need to hit consistently to be competitive for global capital. I also wanted to give a shout out uh, to CN, our, our rail partner. I think they are doing an excellent job in spending capital on their network to make sure that their rail network is competitive. 
Canada is a very large country, particularly when we talk about agri that's produced in kind of the center or, or, or different aspects, far reaches of kind of from tidewater ports. And I think our rail networks are a key part of enabling trade uh, and the fluid movement of those goods uh, is a big aspect to our competitiveness. And, and Paul, from, from, from your perspective, like how, how, how do we make sure that, uh, that our supply chains remain competitive? I think just to echo on the earlier comments, um, you know, we 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 have to be able to uh, to invest, invest quickly. We we compete for capital, and and the capital we compete for, as as an example, the container terminal operator in Halifax is uh, is PSA Global. They're an international firm. They they chose Halifax. Right, we're fortunate to have them. I mean, we're we're no different than the other uh, other Canadian ports that handle containers. We've all got world class operators, and we're, and we're lucky to have them. So we have to do what we can to support them because they, when they go back to their their boards and make decisions, they can invest in this port or that port or this country or that country, right? So it's important that we make it easy for them to do business here. Uh, the other thing that I, that I perhaps should have mentioned in, in the last question, it re revolves around labor. You know, power industry is no different than everybody else's. There's, there's critical labor shortages throughout the supply chain, and it's important that that we bridge these labor gaps in, in these key industries and, and transportation sector in particular. I mean that'll include immigration, training, reskilling of workers with this with this industry in mind because it's it, it may not be the first industry people think of as they're as they're going through their elementary and high school, oh I'm going to grow up to be this kind of a transportation worker or a port worker or whatever. And I think it's something that uh, we're pretty focused on in, in at the Port of Halifax in, in in telling our story so that people see it is a, it is a good livelihood and it is it is something that people can be successful at. And, and, and Guillaume, kind of moving moving over to you. And, and sorry, sorry. No, no. And, and, I'll, and I'll even repeat the question, Guillaume. Is, is, is no, no, how, it's a, no, 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 no. Make sure no. we're competitive. Yeah, no worries. No, I, cause I was trying to unmute myself uh, <laughs> on my iPad and uh, I was stuck in two buttons. So, uh, no, actually, and, and it's, uh, you, you know, 80% of our goods uh, that we are consuming, uh, including food and and uh, and uh, grain, yes, uh, are trade uh, by uh, by sea and goes through ports. So being competitive uh, is is the key. Uh, and who do we compete with? Uh, well, of course, our neighbors of, of the south uh, that are investing a lot of, of of money, a lot of capital to enhance their supply chain and to make it uh, to enhance the capacity to. And one thing that uh, I think everybody said uh, on, on on the panel is uh, about about the rail, and I I cannot uh, agree more with what Michael said on on the CN investment that they do in the network. The CP also CPKC is also investing a lot. Uh, we are fortunate in Montreal to be connected to both Class One railroads, CN and CPKC, uh, and this is a key. I mean, it's a whole system that needs to be in. Uh, I would say dancing uh, with each other in a very uh, i would say com not comprehensive but a fluid and and uh, hand to hand and this is uh, having investment in ports it's important but the rail also is key especially in canada where everything is connected by rail and almost everything moves by rail especially uh, in ports uh, the other thing that uh, i would say for to be able to be competitive as a country and to invest uh, to invest to attract investment uh, into our regions uh, there's three things that uh, I would say an organization will look into before implementing, let's say, an industry or manufacturing uh, company is uh, energy, uh, labor, that's, as was mentioning Paul, and transportation. How can these three uh, pilars uh, be uh, competitive and, and have access to these three pilars in the long term business? Not for the upcoming five years when you invest, like Nordvolt or Volkswagen did in battery uh, factories in Ontario or, uh, or Quebec. They're looking uh, for, for 20, 30 years, 40 years ahead. Uh, so we need to be able to support that kind of investment and, and promote transportation as much as we promote uh, energy. Um, and a last thing that uh, I want to mention is, um, you know, ports, as I was saying, are, we're limited in the way we could, uh, we could work. Uh, we're very direct, focused on port activities, but there's also other things that we could uh, piggyback on or, or be more implicated in to facilitate. I'll give an example, transloading facilities, dry ports that are actually built to connect and to 
uh, to make ports more uh, fluid and more resilient. Uh, and I know that that uh, on the West Coast, there's a bit more of these kinds of facilities uh, than what we have uh, over here. So this is things that uh, we can uh, invest and put our efforts in uh, in order to uh, make our network, the whole network, uh, more competitive uh, and attract these investments. Like uh, Paul was saying with a PSA as an, an international firm, we want them, or DP World, the same thing. We want them to be able and to be uh, comfortable in, in, of investing and supporting uh, our trades. And, 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 and David, uh, same same question to you. How, how can we uh, ensure our, our supply chains remain competitive? Well, a big, big part of it is uh, maintaining our reputation. I mean, when we, we've just been through a strike, we've seen numerous uh, major environmental issues with floods and fires, and our customers have long memories. And, uh, you know, I recall in my previous life with the, with the railway, um, you know, you'd go to see, see someone and they'd, they'd raise a strike that happened 10 years earlier. I mean, these, these things don't go away quickly, and it's a, it's a constant uh, challenge that, that I think all the players have to uh, play a role in, in terms of, uh, of showing them what we're doing differently and and uh, and uh, being able to assure our customers that uh, that we can deliver, uh, it's uh, it's absolutely absolutely key. Um, another thing that I think we have to keep a very close eye on is the whole question of social license. Um, we operate in an area of 2.8 million people with 16 different municipalities and you know, a large number of First Nations and um, ensuring that we're doing the right things to maintain public support uh, is, is essential. Um, to be able to build the projects to improve the uh, fluidity of the network, to improve the supply chain. Uh, if we wanna be able to keep doing those things, obviously we have to, have to maintain social license and it's, it's, uh, it's const something we need to constantly focus on in terms of our interaction with, uh, with First Nations, in terms of, uh, of uh, continuing to move forward on uh, on environmental challenges, because if we if we don't do that, then uh, we aren't going to be able to make the kind of improvements we've got to make to to stay competitive and stay ahead of the game. And and and, and maybe kind of uh, you know building building on that point, David, uh, I'll, I'll kind of stick with you. Um, is 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 really you know that 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 piece of our Canadian advantage. Maybe, maybe what is our what is our Canadian advantage, and 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 how can we make sure that 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 uh, that that our our Canadian enterprises, Canadian businesses, are are, are utilizing Canadian ports to, to 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 their advantage, and 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 to get to, to get goods to market. Well, I mean, it's it's I suppose it's the same same question and in reverse. I mean, they've got to be confident that uh, that we can uh, we can deliver the service that they they need. Um, that uh, that we're not that we're not the bottleneck in the system, and I think generally speaking, Canadian ports are not the bottleneck in the uh, in the system. Um, but uh, you know, you've got to continue to to show that and 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 promote the uh, that what we uh, what we do have to what we do have to offer, and and reliability is a big part of it. Um, I mean, I worry in terms of, uh, for example, the floods in BC. I'm not sure that there's enough. Proactive work being done uh, by government and others to uh, to prepare for the next floods, which will eventually come. It's, in, it's inevitable, and and I I'm not sure that uh, you know. I mean, everybody was very pleased with the the way how quickly the network got back up and 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 how quickly the railroad roads in particular dealt with this. How quickly they were able to get roads uh, open again. Uh, the things that we were able to do at the border in order to facilitate trucks moving uh, through through the U.S. until the network was back up and, and operating. But I'm not sure enough thought is being given to uh, to what do you do to, to uh, mitigate it, if it before it uh, before it happens again. And, and Michael, kind of continuing along the same line, like how you know how can how can we push a Canadian advantage and, and, and make sure that, uh, that 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 our Canadian ports are are, are remaining competitive. Apologies, I'm muted there. Um, <laughs> someone had to do it. <laughs> I, th I think we've talked about a lot of these themes. I, I think stitching it all together, I think it starts with having uh, increased collaboration with trade enabling and transportation partners domestically. 
I think it starts with kind of looking at common challenges that the country and or Canadian port authorities are facing to kind of achieve efficiencies or, or grow capacities and capabilities. And then it's all about building, rebuilding or building and improving our reputation as a, as a trading partner. I think, as David said, our, our trading partners have very, very long memories. And uh, depending on what commodity group we're, or we're talking about, I think there's a lot of good information that we can kind of start to compile and, and validate how we are really doing a good job uh, in most cases or most of the time in terms of enabling trade, whether that's agri or, or other commodities. And, 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 and Guillaume, same, same, same question. Yeah, I think uh, my colleagues touched a few very good points and I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll build on, on what just uh, Michael just said on, I think we need to rebuild the trust uh, and that's, that's important for, uh, for companies and for exporters. I mean, using uh, the Canada, the Canadian supply chains. I mean, we've seen it uh, this last summer. You were referring to labor dispute. Uh, we're seeing it right now on the St. Lawrence Seaway, and it's clogging the whole thing. And and what the 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 market needs to have is some previsibility, knowing that their goods going to flow, that their vessels are not going to be stuck. Let's say a vessel that is coming from uh, the Med or from Asia, let's say uh, to Canada, if there's uh, a strike coming in during their way. I mean, what do they do with that uh, ship with these containers? Where it, there's, it's, it's very, it's not an easy, uh, an easy thing. It's very complicated. But uh, there's, uh, I think we cannot cross, uh, not cross. We cannot close a border, and we cannot close a border for goods. Uh, and ports are borders for goods. So, uh, and same thing for other major aspects of the supply chain that are connecting the ports all together. So this is something that uh, that is uh, that we can work on uh, as a whole. And I think I'm, I'm looking forward to see uh, the postmortem uh, of uh, Minister O'Regan on, on, uh, on the, um, uh, on the, I would say the labor uh, aspects of uh, uh, in the transportation industry overall uh, to see how, what's going to be the outcome. Uh, but I mean, what we're uh, seeing now, especially since the past weekend, um, the North Siri is uh, is uh, something that is uh, that is uh, I would say uh, uh, impacting uh, in a very very big way. Uh, a lot of the aspects are uh, of the economy right now. Uh, so that's uh, say I'll leave it to this uh, on my side. Uh, but these are uh, I would say the two three things that I think are worth mentioning and and thinking of. And, and Paul, how how, uh, how how can we make sure uh, that our Canadian advantage is is, is being used uh, being used here? I think just following up on the earlier comments, um, in the last twenty years or so, all the Canadian ports have been really focused on infrastructure development. People have expanded their ports and expanded their berths and added added equipment and the, to the terminal operators, et cetera. And I think that's been a little bit to the detriment of of a focus on labor. And, and we're, we're fortunate in Halifax and that we haven't had any labor stoppages. However, we've got similar challenges to other folks in other ports in the sense that we have, we're at times labor shortages. And it, it goes back to what I talked about earlier. We, we, we have to develop a stable labor force and that doesn't just mean no stoppages. That, that means additional new people coming into the industry and, and, and replacing the people that are exiting. I know, I know for us in Halifax, we had a, we had a record year in terms of container volumes and in 2022, we'll be a little bit off that this year, but to get back to that level again, the constraint is labor. We could go further with it, right? We don't necessarily have to have to build new berths or, or buy new cranes. It's 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 really how do we how do we better employ and utilize labor? No, and I think I think that's a, that's a great point, Paul. And I and I think you know it, it it applies to to a lot of what we've talked about today. I think I think whether we're talking about data labor regulation i think it's 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 how how can we how can we look at these things from a from a smarter way it's it's uh um you know less less about maybe maybe getting rid of everything which which i think uh, oftentimes is uh you know when talking about the regulatory process um government tends to think that uh, that, that we're trying to get rid of every piece of, of regulation that exists within the country um which is is is, is uh, it couldn't be further from the case i think it's it's how do we do these things smarter to 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 make sure that uh, that that we're doing things you know as efficiently as possible 
Um, kind of my last question, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've been looking at looking at the time, I'm, I'm going to try and squeeze my, my last one in, you know, any any advice for, for, for the ag sector here? Um, you know, you guys obviously play uh, play a massive piece in, 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 in being able to connect Canadian agriculture to to global markets. Um, any any last pieces of advice or, or, or kind of comments uh, to, to pass along? Paul, I'll start with you. We'll go we'll go east to west this time. Okay, no problem. Um, I guess the advice would be um, look look for new look for new markets. It's 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 surprising how far we can reach through the ports, right? A lot of people think they have a you know they're they're have an international business because they ship to the United States. You know, all due respect to the U.S., there's there's hundreds of millions of people elsewhere in the world, and 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 through the various ports in the country, we can reach them, right? We all have a number of, a number of services and a number of ways, and if it if it can fit in a box, it can get there pretty easily. So that would be my advice: is is, is to look broader. And and Guillaume, from from uh, from your side. Yeah, I'll I'll piggyback on what just Paul said. It's it, you know things are changing very fast. Uh, and we were talking about climate changes. It's not. It's not if. It's when. Uh, uh, I would say uh, something will impact us. So I would. I would say uh, be agile. Uh, be at the forefront of what's happening and try to anticipate and react very quickly uh, and explore new markets. I think what we are seeing on the geopolitical landscape right now is uh, is, is, is since the past two three years it's been uh, a bit confusing and. Uh, and sometimes, uh, I mean, the, we need to react and to be able to assess. And that creates, yes, sometimes it hurts, but also it creates opportunities. So I would say uh, be agile uh, and, uh, and uh, resilient. Uh, these are things that are, I would say, um, uh, that, that is coming on top of my head right now. Michael? Uh, I'll build on something maybe a bit different, and in this case, I'll acknowledge I'm getting into territory that I'm not as familiar with, but I definitely would be curious to engage with industry and learn more around ways to improve productivity. I think ultimately ports want to see as much volume across their dock, inbound or outbound as possible. On the agricultural space, I think there's unique challenges in terms of the seasonality of kind of the growing seasons. I, I mean, I think one thing I've been noticing over the last couple of years when we've had uh, growing or crop yield challenges over the last three years because of growing conditions. I think any time you can start uh, minimizing the volatility and the volumes that are moving to gateways or coasts, it's going to help you improve and optimize the supply chain. I'm not saying that this is like a perfect scenario, but I think there's an opportunity with climate change seemingly driving a lot more volatility in, in volumes and, and yields and those kind of things. I think also I'd, I'd, I'd like to learn more and I welcome any participants on this call to reach out to me around how we can improve productivity or make it more consistent uh, in, inland while we continue to improve supply chains and tidewater capacity. And, and David. Sure, I guess the, the, the one thing I maybe would, would add to what's already been said is uh, just the importance of, uh, of talking to the supply, supply chain partners and giving as much notice as, as possible in terms of the change that's coming. I mean, a good good example where things have, have gone very well is, you know, we're seeing a, a significant shift on the prairies in terms of value added processing. And, you know, uh, I've lost count of how many new canola crush facilities are are coming on, on board uh, in the next few years in, in the prairies, but clearly we're going to be moving a lot more, uh, a lot more liquids, uh, liquid canola in liquid form, as opposed to moving, uh, moving bulk canola. And, uh, you know, I think we'll be well positioned to uh, to be able to handle that capacity, but obviously, any any kind of dramatic change like that, the the more notice and the more uh, the more discussion that takes place early on, uh, the better off for everyone. Well, I, I think we're 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 out of time. Uh, I officially can say that I I for once have uh, have have been on time uh, for 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 one of these. So so thank you. Um, you know, David, Michael, Guillaume, Paul, um, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to, to be with us today and, and, and to talk about this, uh, that this is very important uh, issue for us. And, uh, and, and, and before we close today's executive summit, I'd, I'd, I'd once again like to thank our, our speakers, moderators. So Minister McCauley, Mohammed Yagi, Steve Rahul, Guillaume Brassard, David Miller, Michael Amman, and Paul Misakaisek. Thank you for engaging with us on a topic of critical importance to Canada's economic security and to the needs of the growing population. 
as one of the largest exporters of food and fertilizer, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to Canadians and our allies to step up and meet the demand for Canada's agriculture products. I'd also like to thank our Food Supply Council members for sharing your expertise and passion for this vital sector over the past two years. It's been through your willingness to come together and respond to the challenges and opportunities that we keep Canada and the world fed. A special thank you to past and present co Council co-chairs, Catherine King, Vice President of Communications and Stakeholder Relations at Fertilizer Canada, and Nicole McCauley, former Head of Communications and Public Affairs for BASF Canada. And thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you again at our Life Sciences Executive Summit on Wednesday, November 7th. Public and private sector collaboration is critical if we're going to achieve the government and healthcare system objectives of world-class integrated health data ecosystem. For more details on the event uh, and the agenda speakers, please visit the Canadian Chamber's website. Registration is open for in-person and virtual attendance. Thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.